Uh, let's start just with the with a headline story. FTX, which is the largest, the third largest um, uh, crypto trading platform, uh, together with its sister company Alameda Research, which was a nominally a crypto a trader, not a trading platform, but somebody who traded crypto for profit and uh, did other things as well, invested in different crypto companies, invested in different things. We'll, we'll get to Alameda in a little bit. Uh, both of those companies, plus the U.S. subsidiaries, uh, Alameda is in Hong Kong and FTX is, uh, is uh, established in... Um, uh, established in Bahamas. I, 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 I will stop calling people by name to do it. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry guys. Um, but thank you for all of you who are subscribing to uh, the membership platform, thank you. So uh, all of the entities in the US subsidiaries uh, as of Friday filed for bankruptcy. Uh, Sam Backman Freed, Sam Backman Freed, who goes by SB, SBF, and is known as SBF in the crypto world and, and, and talks about himself as SBF in the crypto world. Um, SBF, six months ago or so, seven months ago, in the spring, was worth $26 billion. He's the second um, uh, largest fortune made from crypto, as far as we know. Uh, there might be richer people who we just don't know. But SBF had 26 billion with a B, a billion with a B, um, as of in the spring. As of uh, last Friday, not this Friday, or the, a week ago, maybe two weeks ago, don't know, I'm not sure the exact date right now, um, he was worth $16 billion. So he had lost some money with all the crypto challenges and all the crypto, uh, everything else, uh, you know, declining in crypto. He had lost some money, but he was still worth $16 billion. I don't know if you have a sense how much money that is. That is unbelievable um, in terms of the, 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 the size of, of wealth, the, the quantity of wealth, one of the richest people in the world. As of today, he's worth somewhere in the vicinity of zero, zero. Um, that is one of the largest individual wealth, although I'm going to put wealth in quotation marks for now, wealth destruction in history. Um, and it's happened faster than I know from anybody. So we saw it collapse within a week from 16 billion to zero. That's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. All right, so let's try to walk through this and, and let's try to see first, uh, we'll talk a little bit about SBF um, uh, and uh, we'll talk, uh, we might mention uh, CZ whose name I can't pronounce, but CZ, who is actually the richest person in the crypto world, who is the CEO, founder, and owner of Binance, another crypto exchange. Um, so I want to go through kind of the history of this, the story that is involved uh, about this. And, um, and uh, you know, we can, uh, we can see then what lessons can be learned on this. It's, it's very simple to say SBF, is a dishonest guy, is a bad guy, he's just, you know, he's, you know, that's it. it. It has no relevance to the rest of the world because he's just a bad guy, he's a fraud, he's a crook. Maybe, maybe to turn out he's a fraud and crook. Certainly, there's no question that he did some fraudulent things here. There's no question that, uh, that he, uh, he lied and deceived. Uh, that's no question. The, the bigger question is, uh, why did people engage with him. If everybody knew he was a father and crook, why did people continue to engage with him? Why did this scheme continue to go on for as long as it did? Why was he worth $16 billion? Um, is this relevant to anybody else? After all, FTX is not the la first, not the first crypto exchange to go under. 
It's not the first crypto scheme to go under. Many others have gone under. In particular, some very large ones over the last six months have gone under. So is this really an aberration? Is this an aberration because one individual is a bad guy? Or does this represent something more substantial about crypto and a weakness in the system and in the market? And then now the big question, of course, which is going to hover all of this in a big way, and you're going to see people talking about this a lot, is does this mean, does this mean that, you know, uh, uh, crypto needs to be regulated, controlled? Indeed, does this, is this proof, as many people are already claiming, and more, you'll hear more in the, in the days to come, is this proof that generally finance has to be regulated? Because finance left alone, as crypto generally is left alone, results in instability and collapse and disaster and all these horrible things that are actually indeed uh, happening in the crypto world. So is this a consequence? And this, this will be the language. Is this a consequence of too much freedom? Of too much freedom? Right? So... Um, So those are kind of some of the issues I think that are important to discuss and 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 go through as as uh, we look at this. And if I skip any of what I just promised to talk about, feel free to send me a um, a um, what do you call it a super chat to remind me that I promised to talk about X or Y or Z. All right. I see a lot of super chat questions coming in. That's great. Uh, we've got time today. We should cover them all. Uh, it would be great if uh, ultimately we had some on the topic. I also see a lot of twenty and hundred dollar for Michael. Thank you, uh, Michael. Uh, super chat questions coming in. Uh, feel free to uh, yeah. I mean, uh, twenty plus uh, dollar questions are significantly preferred, particularly when we have a, a lot of content and we can't go all day. Uh, so yes, I, uh, let's let's blow away the six hundred and fifty dollar goal. Um, and and uh, and you know reinforce uh, this uh, the, the 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 new strategy for the Iran book show. Okay, so uh, just a little bit of history because I think it is interesting. Sam Beckman Freed, uh, graduate from MIT. He's got both his parents are professors of law at Stanford, which is interesting because I I suspect Sam uh, is going to need a good lawyer. Uh, he, so he comes from a, 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 a successful family, a, a family of academics. He is an MIT grad, so he obviously did well. He worked for uh, Janus, I think, Janus Securities uh, for a while, and then left in 2017 to found a, a, a crypto trading um, a firm. So this is a firm that actually trades in crypto, and this is Alameda Research. Sam is SFB. Sam is Sam SFB, SBF, sorry. SBF, Sam is the founder and uh, up until th Friday, the CEO of uh, FTX. So um, he founded uh, Alameda Research as a trading company. Uh, he founded this company in Hong Kong uh, to avoid basically US law and US regulations because the things he was doing were illegal in the United States. Um, and a, a, a lot of what they did early on was what's called arbitrage. Arbitrage is, you know, arbitrage should be risk-less. And what you're doing with arbitrage typically is taking advantage of mispricing, of a price. Let's say, let's say, um, um, I'm trying to think of an example. Let's say the iPhone is selling uh, in at the store over here for a thousand dollars, and across the road, it's selling at a store for fifteen hundred dollars. And you could trade; you can trade with the stores, and you can replace the store. So basically, you go into the store for a thousand dollars, and you buy it, and basically you sell it for fifteen hundred dollars. You're, you're the store on the other side of the road; you sell for fifteen hundred dollars now. I, like, that can't happen if the stores are across the street from one another because people would go to the cheapest store and they would never go to the more expensive store. Uh, but it can happen on sophisticated assets like a Bitcoin when the two assets are trading 
on exchanges on different continents, maybe with different rules, maybe because, maybe because uh, there's a, information is moving slowly, maybe you have some kind of informational edge, or maybe you have just a, 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 a trading edge. So uh, what, what uh, SBF, what they would do is, uh, SBF is Sam uh, Backman Reed's feed. So what Alameda Research would do is they would buy, uh, they would buy uh, Bitcoin where it was cheap and sell Bitcoin where it was expensive. And you don't make huge amounts of money on any particular deal, but if you do it in bulk, you can make a lot of money. Now, this was a business in 2017 that was quite profitable. Today, it probably is not profitable at all because a lot of people in the business, as you do that, the prices converge and it goes to zero. So it just doesn't exist anymore. And, and of course, uh, networks have become faster. Arbitrage has become, as networks become faster, arbitrage goes away. But that's how we got to start, basically, on trading strategies, how to make money off of Bitcoin trading. That expanded how to make money off of crypto trading, generally buying and selling crypto and to some extent speculating, buying the cryptos that have maybe peaked, uh, sorry, selling the cryptos that have maybe peaked, buying the cryptos that were up and coming. Uh, you know, cryptos have this, uh, you, you could launch a crypto and it can go through the roof suddenly. Uh, Dogecoin, if you remember, which was launched as a joke, uh, was embraced by Elon Musk and it went through the roof and it still trades at a massive price. Um, so uh, the whole idea is to try to figure out who are the losers and who are the winners and buy and sell and buy and sell and buy and sell. And then he got into the business and he created FTX and FTX is a platform that basically allows people to store their coins, their cryptos, and to trade them, to go through this exchange, right? I can, I can buy it. I can give them dollars and get Bitcoin. I can store my Bitcoin. I can use that Bitcoin to buy Ethereum, or I can buy Dogecoin, or I can buy FTT, which is the coin issued by FTX, which is the exchange. They issued a coin. Think about the FTT coin, the coin some crypto companies issues. It's almost like stock that they've issued. It gives you some stake in the company. Now, you're, a lot of people, because they're trading, right? They're, they're buying and selling, buying and selling, buying and selling into different, different cryptos uh, and also in and out of dollars. They store their crypto in at the, at, the, at the exchange. So it's stored at FTX so that it can easily be, you've got an account at FTX, just like you guys have an account um, uh, let's say it's Schwab and then, you, you know, the money's sitting in account in cash and then you can use that cash to buy stocks whenever you want. So you don't have to like, oh, I need to, I want to buy a stock right now. Let me transfer money from my bank to Schwab. And then, no, you keep the money at Schwab. Well, people kept the equivalent of their money, their cryptos at FTX so that they could trade them. Now, FTX promised that everything that you stored at FTX was going to be held by FTX, so anytime you would want it, anytime you wanted to withdraw your money, it would be there because they claimed they had it fully reserved. Turns out that was a lie. It turns out that they were using some of your deposited crypto for other purposes. Maybe the biggest purpose that they used this other crypto was to lend money to their sister company, also owned by F, uh, SBF, and that sister company was is Alameda Research. Now, Alameda Research, when uh, as being trading, we don't know how much money it, it it was making on trading. It was doing speculative things, but it was also investing in um, in um, startups, in crypto startups. All kinds of crypto startups, very, very illiquid, can get out of a crypto startup very quickly, if at all, if ever. Right? So it was acting like a venture capitalist in addition to trading, in addition to doing who knows what. We will find out in the months to come what else they were doing. Okay, remember that. In addition to that, when a lot of the other crypto exchanges and crypto companies got into trouble Earlier this year, Alameda Research 
marched in and helped bail some of them out. Literally gave them money to bail them out in exchange for, I think, an equity position. Uh, and it sometimes just took them over. So F, F, uh, both the exchange, FTX, and Alameda went in and bailed people out, used whatever resources they had to bail them out. Now, one of the questions is, where were they getting their money? Well, it turns out that a lot of what Alameda Research was doing, this trading and bailing everybody out and investing in venture, was not just the equity, the money that its investors had given it, but it turns out that it was borrowing money from banks, borrowing large sums of money from, you know, I don't even know if it's the banks. We'll, we'll find out again in the months to come. But they were borrowing money from somebody. Large amounts of money they were borrowing in order to engage in, oh, I could say speculation. And I'll say something more about crypto in a minute and, and speculation in crypto. But um, it, it, in speculating and in making these long-term investings, investments. So they were borrowing a lot of money. But when they started bailing out these troubled companies and when Bitcoin started declining dramatically earlier this year and all the other crypto were going down significantly, particularly over the last six months, but really over the last year, when all of that started to happen, its borrowers said, whoa, wait a minute. We want our money back. We're a little worried. This looks a little riskier than we thought in the go, go gate days at the beginning of crypto, you know, last year when anything you touched in crypto went through the roof. We want our money back. We're going to, oh, we're not going to lend you more money or we want you to pay off your debts. Well, it turns out that during that period, FTX lent money to Alameda Research Almaden Research, not Alameda. Almaden or Alameda? Almaden, I think. Almaden Research. Lent their money in order to pay back the banks. Now, what was this money? This is the money that the equivalent of, this was the money backing up those deposits people had with FTX. So they were now taking your deposits and shifting them with the idea that Almaden will pay us back. When they pay us back, we're whole with our investors. No problem. It turned out that Almaden, and I'm sorry, this is getting complicated. I know it's complicated, but you know, life and the world, certainly crypto and fraud generally is complicated. It turned out that Almaden Research, who was borrowing money from all kinds of people, right? Sorry, Alameda, Alameda, okay, so Alameda Research was borrowing money from all these people, was using, in a sense, as collateral, as, as a basis for the valuation, the asset base, they were using FTT, which was the coin issued by FTX. So you can see now how everything was kind of wrapped around itself. There was no there, there. There was no real asset. There was just FTX and Al Alameda switching money around to where it was needed and moving it around. Now, I think FTX was probably profitable off of its trading business, just, just because what does an exchange do? An exchange takes no risk, theoretically. All an exchange does is it facilitates transaction and takes a fee. So uh, it really looks like FTX just straight out on their trading business was profitable. But most of those profits were sent to Al Alameda, which was not profitable, it was losing money, or it was investing in a very, very illiquid stuff that we'll, we won't know if it's profitable for a long, long time. And at the same time, and at the same time, they were covering for each other so that both in the end landed up being insolvent both because a big chunk of FTX's assets now all those profits and some of the deposits were now were now basically an IOU from Alameda but Alameda 
its assets or basically the coin of FTX. One, if one of these two goes under, both go under. So about a week and a half ago, um, an article was published in one of the big crypto magazines, Coin, Coinbase, something like that, basically saying, you know, we've looked at Alameda's balance sheet and it looks kind of spooky. It doesn't look very clean. Something weird, Coindesk, thank you, Coindesk published it. It doesn't look very clean. Something wrong is going on here. It has too much of this FTT stuff, but there's just, it, it looks like this business is really losing a lot of money. As a consequence of that, people started selling the, the coin, FTT, that underlies FTX and Alameda and its price started going down. People also started withdrawing, because they knew of this relationship between FTX and, and Alameda. They started withdrawing the coin from FTX. The real kicker was, I think it was Monday or Tuesday last week, the CEO of Binance, his name is CZ, he goes by CZ, the letter C, the letter Z, announced that they were selling all of their FTT coin. It turns out that they had invested in a bunch of FTT coin. They had a lot of it. Now, we'll get to other reasons why Binance didn't like FTX. There are other reasons, legit, that they didn't like them, but we'll get to that in a minute. And I, I haven't yet looked into the business model of Binance and whether it's solid, but we will see. Um, so CZ announced that they were going to sell a bunch of FTT, all of their holdings of FTT, coin. This, of course, only accelerated the sale of FTT coin across the board. People were drawing their money from FT, FTX. Uh, 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 SBF, Sam Bankman Freed, uh, came on and said, oh, no, don't worry, people, we're, we're fine. We can, we can redeem you. We can pay you back. Um, everything is good. Uh, you know, we can actually, uh, if you've got coin deposited with us, we will return that coin to you. Don't worry about it. Everything's covered. Within a day, it was obvious that was not true. Within a day, it was obvious that they could not, they could not redeem everybody out. They could not send coin to everybody. Um, while SBF was telling the world that everything was fine, no problem, he was calling up potential investors. Uh, beginning, he, used to, he, he tried to raise $1 billion to give them liquidity to be able to cash people out. But as the day evolved, it turned out that $1 billion was not going to be enough. It went up to $6 billion. And of course, there were no investors out there willing to bail him out. Nobody was willing to put the cash, even though for a variety of reasons we will get to, SBF was the poster child of crypto. Nobody was willing to give them the money. And as the week evolved, it was clear that they were bankrupt, that they were going bankrupt. On Wednesday, I think it was, CZ um, uh, announced that, that Binance would actually buy FTX and bail them out. Not clear what the price was, he said. Uh, we'll do our due diligence. We'll determine the price, but we're going to buy it at a significant discount, and we're going to take it over. By Thursday, CZ, Binance, announced that they were not going to buy it, that things looked much worse worse at FTX than they expected, that they did not want the headache, they did not want the hassle, and it didn't look like it was worth it, and they withdrew their offer to buy them. And at that point, FTX imploded. Friday morning, they basically announced a complete and utter bankruptcy. We'll see how many people get their money back, or, you know, uh, uh, how many people, you know, there are billions of dollars here of people's deposits. Uh, some people will get their money, some people will not, some people will get a fraction. We will see how it all uh, ultimately evolves. All right, put a line in the sand there. That's kind of the story of what's happened. One other dimension to this, which I think is fascinating, and uh, which is really reflected in, um, in a Washington Post headline from um, yesterday, which I think I think captures uh, 
a dimension of this which I think is interesting. Crypto, this is the, this is the headline. Crypto king Sam Bankman-Fried charmed Washington, then FTX failed. <laughs> now, this is actually a pattern, a pattern. Um, it turns out that Sam Bankman-Fried was at the forefront of trying to get government to regulate crypto. He was very active in Washington, D.C. He knew everybody in Washington, D.C. Indeed, there is now suspicion that uh, the SEC, I think SEC Chairman uh, uh, Gensler, um, was somehow involved with uh, SBF and maybe, maybe even received some funds from him. So maybe there's corruption at the highest levels of the SEC. We don't know. Pure speculation. But there is a story out that suggests that maybe something Something was going on there that is, uh, that is irresponsible um, or, or fraudulent. But we'll see. I'm not going to say it is because I don't want to get into trouble, I, and I don't know for a fact that that's the case. But there's no question that, that SBF um, spent a lot of time in Washington. Uh, many people say he spent more time in Washington lobbying than he spent in the Bahamas, where the company is based, actually running the company. His lobbying was to try to put together regulation um, that would benefit FTX. And according at least to Binance, CZ at Binance, uh, this regulation would have helped FTX and hurt Binance and hurt the rest of the industry. Indeed, one of the conflicts between Binance and FTX was around this idea of regulation. Binance at least says that they are for, they are for um, markets, free markets, no regulation, let crypto rip, uh, and um, uh, no government regulation, right? Uh, and FTX was obviously for regulation. So one of the areas of conflict and one of the comments that Binance CEO uh, CZ uh, mentioned when he said he was going to sell um, FTX's coin, FTT, was... We don't want to support somebody who's trying to regulate the business and trying to regulate it in a way that favors them and hurts us. So good for them for doing that. Another aspect of SBF's uh, uh, time, if you will, in, uh, in Washington, right, is that, um, you know, this became kind of a political issue. Um, it was not just now just even a regulatory issue. It was not just now an issue of, um, uh, of, of the business model. Uh, Sam Bankman-Fried became, if you will, a, a real political figure. It turns out that SBF uh, is the second largest contributor, second largest individual contributor to the Democratic Party. Anybody know who the largest contributor to the Democratic Party is? I'll give you five seconds to think of it before I tell you. It is, of course, George Soros. The second largest benefactor to the Democratic Party individual is Sam Bankman-Fried, who gave hundreds of millions of dollars last year to the Democrats. Um, SBF uh, got involved in a number of different campaigns, a number of different uh, uh, political issues and became a real force behind the Democratic Party and bought lots of influence within the Democratic Party. This is going to make the whole court hearings and, uh, and uh, his trial and, 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 uh, and uh, you know, prosecution, if it's going to come to that, very, very interesting because this guy is deeply connected into the entire uh, Democratic Party infrastructure. One other dimension of this, which I think is interesting, this is a fascinating case, fascinating case. One other dimension, SBF, not only $26 billion, not only the biggest supporter of the Democratic Party, not only uh, an advocate of regulation, but all of this comes from a philosophical perspective. SBF is one of the more philosophical CEOs, at least was until Friday, CEOs in America. SBF, who's, by the way, only 30 years old, 
Imagine being worth $26 billion when you're not even 30. But SBF, um, 30 years old, was a big, big advocate of effective altruism, which he picked up at MIT. And he claimed that the reason he wanted to be rich, the reason he wanted to make as much money as possible, the reason he wanted to make a gazillion dollars, or gazillion dollars, gazillion, or whatever that is, is to give it away. That's effective altruism. Effective altruism is the idea that you should go into the profession in which you will make the most money so that then you can give that money away and be effective in giving it away. So the other part of effective altruism is when you give it away, you give it to the best causes possible and you monitor them and you, you check their effectiveness in the goal of fill in the blank, whatever the goal that they make up for effective altruism. Indeed, before Friday, effective altruism, uh, 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 SBF and his variety of entities had given well over a hundred million dollars to effective altruism causes. I mean, one of the real cries of despair you probably heard Friday and over the weekend all across America and maybe all across the world uh, is from people who have uh, m m people involved in the effective altruism cause who probably lost a lot of money because a lot of them were it, it were part of SBF of you know, a, a world of, of investment and coins and all of that. So they've lost a lot of money. And second, all the people running charities that were getting money from the effective altruism investors have gone. Indeed, I've seen some articles, um, some articles on the web uh, declaring effective altruism over, finished, gone. And indeed, many of the charities that were doing effective altruism are probably going to be hurting significantly because of um, the extent to which they were dependent on SBF. Anyway, so that is the world in which we live. That is the world in which we live. It's a, it's a it's crazy world. And there's a sense in which all of this is built on kind of a speculative mythology that's going on. There's a mythology around crypto. And that is that these coins are worth anything. That is that there's a business model here that makes some sense. Now, I get Bitcoin. Bitcoin wants to be the world's currency. People who are Bitcoin advocates believe that it will become the world's currency. That if there's enough adoption and it, it has these amazing characteristics and it can be anonymized, that it, it can become a decentralized private currency and they want to demolish central banks and this is the way in which it will happen. And they've created an algorithm with a finite number of Bitcoins so that you can have inflation, you have other problems. I'm not going to get into the whole critique of Bitcoin. You have all, all kinds of other problems, but it's a currency. That's its use. The, the, the use of Bitcoin is a currency. I get that. I even respect that. I don't think it'll ever happen. I think it's a myth. myth. I think it's part of this mythology. But they have a case. There's, there's something to be done here, right? I also think that Ethereum, to some extent, to the extent that I understand Ethereum, is trying to make a case that they are creating something that's more than a currency. They're creating, in a sense, a medium exchange that is tied up with a contract, with a customizable contract. So that when you exchange stuff, you're not just transferring money, but you're actually engaged in a contractual relationship with the other side. And that is what... Ethereum, this is the whole idea of smart contracts and a gazillion's applications for smart contracts. So I get the value, and, and I think there's something there. Again, I don't understand it enough. I haven't dug into it enough to know, but it strikes me that there's something there. I don't think anybody's figured out exactly what that thing is, but I think there's something there. So I get Bitcoin. 
I don't think it will succeed, but I get it. I get Ethereum. I actually think it has a better chance of succeeding, at least the model, whether it specifically exceeds or not. But then what are these other, all these other coins and cryptos? And what are these exchanges actually doing? I mean, it's one thing if the exchanges were involved in people buying Bitcoin or buying Ethereum or buying, let's say, half a dozen other crypto coins that had some rationale behind them. But my understanding is most of what happens in the exchanges is people exchanging coins for coins, tokens for tokens, not using dollars to buy stuff, but constantly just living in a world in which there's speculation around these different coins. Now, the reality is that in the world in which we live right now, 90 plus percent of those coins are actually worthless, that the only thing keeping them afloat is people's interest in exchanging them. There's no there there. This is speculation for the sake of speculation. And indeed, I think it's not just speculation, because speculation is actually a good thing. I'm pro-speculation. This is mostly gambling. I think Dogecoin will go up this week. Let's buy some Dogecoin. Oh, the roulette wheel hit red, and I bet on red. Cool, I won. So what is going on in the crypto world, or has been going on, I'd say, over the last two plus years, is pure gambling. Just, you know, the worst kind of speculation. Now, again, it could be that in some cases, there is some value somewhere. And some of the exchanges that are doing this speculation probably have value because they're making money off of the stupidity of other people. They're facilitating this trade. They actually have reserves to cover all the deposits. They actually have reserved one for one for every dollar deposit they have a reserve. For every coin deposited, they have the coin there. They haven't done what SBF has done. They haven't done uh, you know, what FTX and, and Alameda, which was unique because there was the two entities. They, they haven't done what the, the previous iterations of stable coins, which were anything but stable, algorithmic stable coins, which is just, again, gambling. It's just speculating that as long as people like your coins, everything is fine. The, 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 the algorithm that keeps the coin value stable keeps stable. But as soon as people start disliking your coin, it spirals out of control and you go bust. What did it happen uh, with them in, in just a few days? So most crypto is worth zero and is kept afloat by nothing other than people's subjective desire. Now, People's subjective desires obviously were something. People buy stupid stuff all the time. Remember, maybe you don't remember because this is back in the 70s or whatever, people used to buy pet rocks. I mean, people buy dumb stuff all the time. Stuffed animals for thousands of dollars, all kinds of things. Stuffed animals at least are, are kind of cute. But people are buying coins for the sake of buying coins. There's no there there. What does a coin represent? What is it worth? Worth? Can you even talk about worth? Now, again, NFTs are a little bit more complicated because NFTs, you're getting something in return for your investment. You're getting an image. You're getting something that supposedly unique, gives you some kind of unique property right over it, one of a kind or whatever. Again, that's, you know, your estimation of the value of it, fine. I, NFTs, I have no problem with NFTs. I wouldn't buy an NFT because I don't value the thing that I would be getting. But this isn't even NFTs. This is just coins. It's just, it's just stuff. It's just a, a, a digital zeros and ones. People are fascinated by this, just like they were fascinated by tulips, just like they're fascinated by sudden stocks. They're fascinated by dot-coms. They're fascinated by railroad stocks when they came out. Here, of course, it's all hyped, hyper it's hyper. It's more than any of those. It's a bigger bubble than any of those. Because it, it, it's all abstract. It's so easy. And people have convinced themselves that other people desiring it gives it actual value. Actual value to do what? 
I mean, I get Bitcoin. Bitcoin is if you believe in the dream that it will become a currency one day, well, as a currency, it's going to be very, very valuable because there's a limited supply of it. And if it has to fund every transaction in the world and it's going to replace the dollar, I guess that's where the value comes as a medium of exchange. I, again, I think that's a bad argument. I don't think it's. I don't think it'll ever happen. But if it happened, I get it. But all these other coins don't even have that dream. And, and there's no basis for that dream because many of them can be issued. I mean, uh, uh, one of the things that's happened this morning or yesterday is that they've suddenly discovered 400 million <coughs> extra FTT coins were, were distributed, were issued yesterday out of thin air. Uh, they're supposed to only come out on a certain schedule, and yesterday was not part of that schedule. And then they, So somebody hacked, it looks like somebody hacked the FTX system and distributed 400 FTTs. 400 million FTTs, worth of FTTs. Now, <laughs> God, I mean, that's the point. You could just issue 400, and what's it worth? What are you buying? What's behind it? So while in the case of FTX, there seems to be financial fraud, and we'll get to the kind of financial fraud, because I think it's interesting, because I think most fraud cases, and this is a good example, the, 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 the person doing the fraud never sits down and thinks, how can I defraud people? I don't think SBF was a fraudster in the sense of, I'm going to take people's money, I'm going to steal people's money. That's my goal in life. I think he got into the slippery slope of kind, trying to cover his ass, which is what m mostly happens with financial fraud. We'll get to that in a minute. Crypto today has mostly has no value. Yet people trade it. The only value of the crypto exchanges is people exchanging crypto that probably doesn't have any value. People give it value only because of their desire to hold it. And at some point, that desire switches, goes away, transfers to something else. They need to buy a house. So they have to liquidate their crypto. They need to buy this. They, they live in the real world. So be very, very careful. Be very, very careful. Now, suppose the Binance has a better business model than FTX. I don't know. Do you know for a fact that that's true? One of the things they're trying to get all the crypto exchanges to do is actually audit them so that they have a proof that they have every coin that was deposited still being held there for you. But there's challenges with auditing. Partially, it goes against the whole idea of crypto because you can have human auditors. The whole idea is to eliminate the human. There are protocols that could do the auditing, but they're not foolproof. So they're real challenges. I would be careful. I would be very, very careful. This is in many ways much worse than Enron. But so let's talk a little bit about financial fraud, uh, and then we'll talk about regulation. Um, most financial fraud happens in the following way. And this is what I'm describing now is basically a financial fraud that happened in a number of companies in the, in the early 2000s, late 1990s, early 2000s. Let's say your company is doing great. And every quarter, you're announcing better and better earnings. And the share price is responding accordingly. It's going up and up and up and up. And shareholders are happy, and you are happy as the CEO, and all your employees are happy, and the world is just an amazing, happy place. And then suddenly, one quarter, earnings disappoint, and they don't go up. They maybe stay flat, or maybe they go down a little bit. And you say to yourself, you know, if I announce these earnings, People are going to be disappointed. They're going to be unhappy. People will sell the stock. The stock will go down. Investors will be unhappy. My employees will be unhappy. I will be unhappy. But I know, I'm convinced, convinced that next quarter, we're going to have phenomenal results. So what I'm going to do is this quarter, I'm going to inflate my results a little bit, just so we have a good quarter. Next quarter, when we have a phenomenal quarter, because I know it's happening, I will deflate the results a little bit. This is called income smoothing. I'm going to smooth my income. 
Not going to announce disappointing earnings. Just fudge a little bit, a little bit. Nothing serious. So you do it once. Nothing bad happened. Earning, you know, earnings announced. Stock keeps going up. This is cool. The problem is that the next quarter turns out not to be great. It turns out that maybe the previous quarter was down for a reason. Maybe there's a recession looming. Maybe there's just less interest in your firm. And the second quarter is, again, disappointing. Now, you can announce big disappointment. First quarter would have been little disappointment. Now it's big disappointment. You don't want to do that. She so say, look, this is, just, this is just silly. It's just accumulating. It's just, it, everything's going to be fine. I'll just smooth it again. I'll just, I just, we'll just, and you get your CFO involved and there's enough in, uh, there's enough flexibility with accounting that you can do this without it completely being nuts. You do it again and everything's fine, except the third quarter is even worse than the first two. This is exactly what happened at WorldCom. WorldCom. So you fudge again. And now, if you don't fudge, you're going to have to admit that you fudged in the past, because now it's not smoothing anymore. It's not little stuff anymore. Now it's big. Now you're trying to, trying to save your ass. You, you're really trying to protect yourself. Now it's legal stuff. And you can do this for a while. You can get away with false earnings for a while. And then at the end, and if you get lucky and things turn around and things go through the roof and things become great again, you can probably get away with it. You can smooth it all out. But it really happens that way. And it really happens every time. So once in a while, maybe things will go back up and you'll be fine. But enough times, things will continue going down and you'll be crushed. I have a feeling this is exactly what happened here. FTX wanted to keep a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, really good, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, um, liquidity for its investors. They wanted to be able to redeem everybody. But then, you know, other companies started going bankrupt around, and Alameda was there, and it was like, geez, all this other crypto stuff is so cheap. I got to get involved in this. I don't have enough money right now. I'll just borrow a little bit. I'll pay it back later because I know I'm profitable. And I know, I know, by the way, crypto will turn around. Bitcoin will turn around. Everything will turn around. Remember, everybody holds Bitcoin as collateral because Bitcoin is the most stable. And Bitcoin is down, what, almost 70% for the year? 70, 70. That's a lot. Things will turn around. Everything will be fine. So you help everybody out, and everybody likes you because you're an effective altruist, and everybody loves you, and they send their love to you. Uh, but then things get worse, and, 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 and now you know, some of your investment go bad, and Bitcoin continues to go down, and other cryptos that you're using as collateral continue to go down, and uh, you, you, the whole balance sheet is off, and you have to lend even more money to Alameda. And, uh, but it'll all turn around. I'm, I'm sure SBF, till the very last minute, believed that, oh, you know, crypto is such a solid asset, it's all turned around. Everything will be great. But it isn't. Because once, this is a great moral point. Here's the moral point. Uh, this is the objectivist moral point. Evasion never works. Evasion always leads to spiraling out of control. Lying, deception, dishonesty. And by the way, the worst kind of lying the worst deception, the worst dishonesty is lying to yourself, being dishonest with yourself. Always involves more and more and more and more dishonesty. It doesn't just end. It doesn't get fixed. Things just get worse constantly. Always. So you can learn for life about, from this. You don't just have, not just if you're in finance, generally in life. Once you start deceiving yourself and others, once you start on a path of deception, there is no coming back. It is a disaster. It is an absolute disaster. Evasion, ignoring facts of reality, pretending things are not, are, are something different than what they really are. Pushing stuff into the future. Oh, I'll think about it tomorrow. 
famous line from, um, from um, God, Gone with the Wind, from Gone with the Wind. I'll think about it tomorrow. Whenever you're tempted to do that, stop. You're self-destructing. Thing, bad things are happening. Don't do it. So uh, that kind of evasion, that kind of dishonesty, that kind of pushing things to tomorrow, I'll think about it then, I won't think about it now, I'll pretend things are better than they are, always comes back, always backfires, always is destructive. That's the bigger moral point here. Okay. Think it through. Face, you know, we all fail. We all make mistakes. We all screw up. All of us. Face it. Admit it to yourself. And if you have investors or you have employees, you have, admit it. Pay up. Pay the piper. You will be so much better off. If disappointing earnings happen the first quarter, okay. Stock will go down. I'll be worth a little bit less. So what? But I'll have my integrity. I'll have my honesty. And yes, it might get worse, but then I need to look at why are earnings going down? That's the question. Is it a recession? Is it the economy? Is it me? Is it the company? Do I have some bad salespeople? What is going on? But you see, by, by, by covering it over, you don't take the necessary actions to fix it. By rationalizing it away, you don't do what is necessary to put you back on the right track. You rationalize it away. And then things are guaranteed to get worse and worse and worse because you never fix the problem that the bad earnings or the bad something is reflective of. So a lot of good life advice from following these things and knowing what, what not to do in the future. All right. Um, Let's see. Uh, two other things I think that, were, that, are, that I find interesting. One is a lot of times companies that have CEOs that spend more time in Washington, D.C. than they do at uh, corporate headquarters are the first ones to go. Uh, Enron was like this. The CEO of Enron really didn't run the company. He was in charge of regulatory schmoozing. So um, a good sign of a stock to avoid, of a company to avoid, of a person to avoid, of a business to avoid, is when they themselves spending huge amount of time in Washington, D.C. I, I guess everybody needs lobbyists. But if you're there, if you're schmoozing, if you're interacting, if you become politicized in that way, you're probably not doing what's good for the business. So avoid political schmoozing CEOs. Jeff Immelt of GE was a schmoozing political CEO. So that's one. Second, this is not to condemn markets. This is what happens in markets. People do stupid things. They pay for them. And some of the people doing the stupid things are the people who invest in these kind of people, the people who use these kind of exchanges and don't do their due diligence. Don't do a proper due diligence into what's going on. Ultimately, they're going to be responsible for what happens. So this is not sold by regulation. Enron was a regulated business. Many, indeed, I would argue that more financial crises happen in regulated industries than in unregulated industries. So regulation is never the solution. And indeed, uh, banks, um, when they were free market under a proper property rights regime, not in the United States, but in places like Canada, Scotland, did phenomenally well with no regulation, even though they had fractional reserve banking. But they held enough reserves. And they were disciplined by the market. 
and you didn't have the kind of bank runs you had in the U.S., which was a politicized financial system from day one. The more politicized it becomes, the more problems there will be. Regulations doesn't solve this. Now, there are no bank runs in America, banks anymore, at least small banks anymore, because we have FDIC insurance. So the government can solve the bank run problem. But by doing FDIC insurance, you create other problems. Moral hazard problems, you create other problems that are associated with inefficient banks, with lack of innovation, lack of progress, lack of good investments, all kind of other problems. Regulations are never the solution. I have to admit that one of the astounding things about FTX is that some of the investors in FTX are pretty smart guys. Sequoia Capital had $260 million invested in FTX. They have basically written a letter to the investors saying they have written that down to zero. They have lost $260 million of their investors' money on FTX. Now, Sequoia can afford to do that because they make so much money on other investments, or at least used to. We'll see in the future if Sequoia is the same Sequoia as it was when it, you know, the founders of Sequoia basically passed away. So this generation of Sequoia VCs, are they as good? Do they know what they're doing? I saw them once make a big investment in a company that went bust in nine months. So even in the good old days, they went bankrupt more than they succeeded. But when they succeeded, they succeeded so much that they could afford to go many, many times bankrupt. But this is still a big amount. All right. Thank you for listening or watching The Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbrookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see The Iran Brooks Show grow, please consider sharing our content, and of course, subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.